to do a quick introduction. Uh, today, we have one of our second year nephrology fellows here at Vanderbilt University Medical Center, Dr. Alisar L. Chidiak. Uh, she did her uh, medical school training and internal medicine, medicine uh, residency at uh, the American University of Beirut before making her way all the way here to Nashville, Tennessee to do her nephrology fellowship. And this coming year, she's actually gonna be doing a transplant uh, nephrology fellowship and, at Vanderbilt as well. Welcome Dr. Olchidiak and uh, excited to hear about today's topic. All right. um, thank you for this introduction, Dr. Elshami. Welcome everyone. Um, we have a full decorum here. Uh, and welcome to everyone who's joining us on Zoom as well to this uh, to today's Journal Club. All right, let me see. I'm seeing my your. All right, so this is where it all began. Um, I was with Dr. Golper in clinic, and we had a 50-year-old male with CKD5 secondary to polycystic kidney disease. And, you know, as part of our visit, we were discussing the dialysis modalities, and obviously we suggested PD. Um, in my mind, still as a first-year fellow when this happened, I was wondering how that would go in the setting of the whole organomegaly, because we all know how big polycystic kidney um, kidneys are. So I decided to read more about it, and I came through... Uh, this article. And this is the uh, article we're going to be discussing in today's uh, journal club. It's the intraperitoneal pressure in polycystic and non polycystic kidney disease patients treated by PD. And it's actually an Italian study. So, this is briefly the outline of this presentation. So, really, why should we care about polycystic kidney disease? Polycystic kidney disease, as you all know, is an inherited systemic disease characterized by numerous fluid filled cysts in the kidneys and other organs as well. So obviously, in addition to its effects on the kidneys, it does have some extra renal manifestations. PKD can be inherited as autosomal dominant or like the ADPKD or as an autosomal recessive trait. But for the sake of this presentation, uh, we will usually just focus on ADPKD and the uh, what the, the, the population in the, this study is also autosomal dominant, because usually um, ADPKD is obviously the dominant. It's way more common than the recessive one. Um, it's the fourth most uh, common single cause of ESRD in the U.S. and in the and in wor worldwide. So it's obviously something we should be um, discussing and we should be familiar with as nephrologists. So previously, the presence of ADPKD was considered by some as a relative contraindications to choosing PD as a renal replacement modality. And then the basis for this thinking was that the enlarged kidneys would, for various reasons, impair the patient's ability to tolerate the intraperitoneal volume or the IPV of the uh, PD fluids. Hello, sir. I don't, I don't know if this is on purpose or not, but since you're on presenter mode on that computer, we can see all your notes. I don't know if, if that matters to you or not. Um, it does, but let me <laughs> see fix it. Mm. Hold on. Okay, so someone is going to see it. It's either you or the people here. Uh, okay. Okay, what are you guys seeing right now? We can still that? see the, the presenter mode. The yeah, the only, the only way I think to do it whereby we don't see it is if you also don't see it. Um, okay, let me... But, but, but if there, yeah. So if you go to like just the regular presenter mode at the bottom right, um, the bar, yeah, that icon, then I think we, none of us see it, but then, you know, if, if you want the notes to, to go through, then you can just keep things the same. It's okay. Are you still seeing it as well? Right now? Yeah. Because, because it's, it's on, you have the regular screen, right? But if you click on that slideshow mode right there at the bottom, right, then we won't see. Yeah. So right now we can't see it, but then I, but then you probably can't see your notes either. Right. Um, and the people here can't even see the presentation. Um, really? Really? Yeah. Let me put it on the side. Let me go to. Um, yep, we're please. using two screens. Are you? Yep. 
you see that's no. uh, I'm just trying to fix it for the folks here. Share hmm? screen. No, this would stop it. Oh, were you sharing from your laptop? Yeah. You can just double click on the um, window up there. It's just click now. Yeah. Click on your laptop. Yeah. But if you share a portion of the screen, you wouldn't be able to see the animations. Oh. It's fine. We can. This is you, right? Yeah. So it's this one. Oh no, you can't see the animations. Okay, so is that more important? Yeah, you have to see the animation. We can also see the animation. Portion of the screen. Yeah, you just put the portion of the screen on. See what I mean? Let me try to do Okay. Yes, yeah, so. You wouldn't be able to see the animations. No, not the animations. Um, okay. Anyway, yeah, just give me a second. I'm gonna unplug this from here. All right, I think we can. So what are you guys seeing now on Zoom? Uh, we're seeing the uh, the presentation with the notes at the bottom. It's not slideshow. Yeah. Um, what we can do. It's a problem with just leaving the notes and getting right. on with it. Just, yeah, just, just go for it. Just keep, uh, like, you can just return it to, to the way it was. Um, we can share it from here. All right. And then, and then if you do slideshow, and then on your own computer, I guess you can have the notes. That's what. Okay, perfect. Let's do that. All right. I think we got to this slide. All right. So um, we'll repeat it. So. Um, previously, the presence of the ADPKD was considered by some as a relative contraindication to choosing PD as a renal replacement modality. And the basis of this thinking was that the enlarged kidneys would, for various reasons, impair the patient's ability to tolerate the intraperitoneal volume of the um, fluids. All right. So, moreover, um, it was reported that PD uh, is associated with a high risk of complication, um, such as the abdominal inguinal hernias, the pericatheter uh, leaks, intestinal perforation, peritonitis, increase in discomfort, abdominal pain, need for nephrectomy, and decreased effective uh, surface area and inadequate clearance. <laughs> All right, so um, IPV is one of the main, IPV is the intraperitoneal volume and IPP is the intraperitoneal pressure. So for all the, the coming in the presentation. So IPV is one of the main uh, prescription parameters in PD. Theoretically, IPV positively affects the molecular clearance by increasing the uh, peritoneal membrane contact and the membrane permeability. So IPV should be individualized and aim to maintain uh, an IPP lower than 17 centimeters of water. So keep that number in mind, the 17 centimeter of the IPP. We're going to get back to it shortly and see where it, actually, where it came from. But for now, what is the actually the, what's the relationship between the IPV and the IPP? So IPV parallels with the IPP, which uh, conversely negatively affects the ultrafiltration and perhaps the clearances by mechanisms that still not 
completely clearly defined. And it also leads to a reduced mass transfer area coefficient of the urea, creatinine, urate, and even the beta-2 uh, microglobulin. So this is sort of a, a summary of what happens, higher IPV, higher IPP, less clearances. And as, you can, as we talked about earlier, higher IPP can lead to mechanical complications like hernias, leaks, and reflux. So experimental studies were performed initially in the 1990s. Uh, this is the main study by Durand et al. They measured the IPP after a two hour exchange with a two liter of dialysate and UF in 34 patients on CAPD. So their data showed that an increase of um, IPP of one centimeter water reduces the ultrafiltration by 74 mLs after two hours, uh, after the two hour dwell in a 3.8% uh, glucose solution. So the increased IPP actually reduces the, you know, the respiratory indices, especially the total vital capacity or the, or the VC. Um, due to the decreased diaphragmatic compliance, which mainly affects the expir expiratory reserve volume, and a reduction of the VC or the vital capacity to more than 20% decreases uh, the blood oxygen. And this corresponds to the IPP of the 17 centimeter. So this is where the IPP cutoff of 17 centimeter um, H2O is defined according to the percentage of reduction of the vital capacity, which has no clinical effect. And that's why the 17 centimeter is the cutoff for us. Um, so back to the PKD and PD, and this is actually a, a live, it's actually a specimen of one of the patients uh, that we saw in, in my old hospital. Uh, this is his kidney that was removed. So back to PKD and PD, many nephrologists still have doubts about PD use in this subgroup of, of patients, including myself. That's what I was thinking, what, that's what I thought when we saw this patient in clinic. So the concerns are related to the fear of an increased IPP due to the organomegaly, which may be responsible for the pressure-driven complications or the mechanical complications that we talked about, um, or may lead to the uh, use of the low IPV. That's, I mean, that's what they thought, and that's why they prescribe lower IPVs in these patients, which is insufficient to reach adequate dialysis. Moreover, the clinical determinants of IPP are ill-defined. So we don't really know a lot about which are the um, clinical determinants or what really affects the IPP. So the aim of this study was to measure basically the IPP in PD patients and analyze the relationship between the IPP and anthropometric variables. When I say anthropometric variables, we mean the BMI and the BSA, which the body surface area. Um, and then they also had a subgroup in this study of PKD patients. They also evaluated the relationship between the kidney volume and IPP um, in this um, subgroup. So um, IPP was measured in PD patients in this Italian hospital, it's the San Bartolo Hospital Dialysis Unit, and data was retrospectively collected. In PKD patients, the total kidney volume was measured uh, using CT scans and normalized with, uh, with height. We're going to see how this was done. So first of all, this is like our first measure of outcomes, which is the IPP. How did they get it? IPPs were measured during periodical modified peritoneal equilibration test, which is the PET test, which is done at least one month after PD start. The measurement was performed by an expert nurse, so it was only like one nurse who was doing it. Uh, IPP measurement technique is shown in this figure that you all can see here. The patient is made to lie down in the supine position and um, IPP measurements were done Sorry. Yeah, IPP uh, measurements were done after a non-deep inspiration and a non-deep expiration, and the average between them was considered the final IPP. So you see here, these are, um, you guys can all see my pointer. So these are the uh, measurements, this is the supine position. Um, the correspondent full volume is registered after full drainage along with the demographic clinical and anthropometric data or the BMI and the BSA. So this is uh, the 
for how we got the total kidney volume and then we uh, the height or the HTKP. So for PKD patients, a CT scan was done during the first year of PD. Kidney parameters were measured by radiologists and volume using the Mayo Clinic calculator. So here we can see the, um, <clears throat> sorry, the sagittal and the coronal views that give us the length. And then on uh, this image, we see the anterior posterior and the lateral lateral diameters, which, which give us the width and thickness. And then what happens is that how we get the renal volume or the total renal volume is we use this um, equation. And then they adjust it. And then you can also get a, a HTKV or the uh, adjusted, the height adjusted total kidney volume. All right, so demographic, clinical, and anthropometric data uh, determined at the time of the IPP measurements is reported in this table. Um, a total of 77 patients uh, were included in the study. Um, only 14 of them had BKD. So it's not really a big number of polycystic kidney disease patients. And, and then notice the ratio of the males to females. So we have way more males than we have females. And if you think about it, and I don't want to be sexist here, um, usually males have a higher BMI and higher BSA. So we should think about it maybe that this might influence our results later on. Um, the IPP value, the mean IPP value was 14.9 for a mean IPV for, of uh, 2,700 2, mLs. And IPP was positive positively co correlated with the BMI, while the relation between the IPP and the BSA was very weak and it was barely significant. The, the p-value was actually 0 0.05. Um, so we can, it's a quest, very weak uh, relation. So what do we see here? We should pause for a second and learn about this Pearson correlation before we proceed with the results. Anyone care to share or know what the Pearson correlation um, is or how we can use or interpret this? It's okay if we don't. Okay, um, I can tell you. So the a Pearson correlation is a measure of the strength and um, direction of an association between two linear quantitative measures. In this case, between the IPP and the ratio of the IPV over the BMI. So I, as we can see here and, and the relation and the direction, um, IPP did not correlate with IPV um, when it was expressed as an absolute value. And that's why here we see uh, what we have and what they shared with us in their um, article that was published is actually the um, IPP to the IPV over the BMI. So um, the relation, because the relation became significant when the IPV was adjusted with the um, BMI. This is um, what is shown in this figure, basically. We see a significant negative correlation. It's negative because the line is going down, the direction is downward. Um, it's a negative uh, correlation between the IPP and the IPV over the BMI. So basically, patients with lower IPV over BMI or the uh, ratio um, that are with higher BMIs for a given IPP have a, given, have a significantly higher interperitoneal pressure. So what they then did, the patient population was divided according to the IPP into a high IPP group and a low IPP group. The high IPP group, as you can see, are the patients with an IPP of more than 17 centimeters, which is the cutoff that we talked about, and there were 56 patients. And then the lower IPP group, um, they were 21 patients. So they had IPPs less than 21, uh, less than 17 centimeters. So the high IPP patients had significantly larger BMI than the low uh, IPP. Um, and uh, this effect was also maintained when the IPV was adjusted with the BMI since the higher IPP patients had a um, significant lower IPV uh, over BMI than lower IPP patients. Um, there were no relations between IPP and age, gender, or dialytic age. And as you can see here, um, there was just uh, eight PKD patients in the high IPP and six PKD patients in the low IPP group. So back to the Pearson correlation. 
Um, 14 PKD patients, like I said, were included in the study. However, only 11 out of these 14 had CT scans available to measure the total kidney volume. Um, and um, so what we see here, or what was found in the, they found in their study is that the uh, total kidney volume had a wide range of distribution. So it was basically between 645 ml to even to, to reach 3,787 ml. Um, here we see a positive correlation between the IPP uh, over IPV and the total kidney volume. The p value was like basically 0 0.04. You see the line going up. Um, PKD patients with bigger kidneys have significant increase in the IPP over IPV ratio. So this means basically that they have increased IPP for a given IPP. So the um, PKD subgroup was also divided into high IPP and the low IPP group again. So even this small 14 patients were further sub, uh, subdivided into these groups. Um, we had nine patients, nine patients with high, nine PKD patients with high IPP and five with lower IPP. So high IPP PKD had significantly uh, bigger uh, total kidney volume compared to the lower IPP PKD patients, while no other variables resulted significantly different across the groups. So this is the one that we're seeing. This one here is um, the value for the lower, and this one here is the value for the higher IPP groups. So um, these were the results. Before we delve into the particulars of this study, I just wanted us to have a brief overview of the studies. I don't know how much you can see. I'm going to zoom this for you. So this is an overview of the studies comparing um, PD outcomes for patients with and without ADPKD. It's from a review in PD International by Khan et al. Um, that examined the literature on outcomes and complications associated with the use of PD and ADPKD patients. And they all show basically um, that PKD patients have similar outcomes overall survivals and complication rate when compared to patients without ADPKD. So um, in this PD hour, the PD population in the study that we're discussing, they observed a mean IPP value of 14.9 centimeter for a mean IPV. The mean IPV was about 2,700 mLs, and which is similar to the um, other studies. So um, the first one is the Durand study that we already talked about previously. Um, uh, they, the Durand study found an IPP of 13.4 centimeters for a mean IPV of around uh, 2,800 mLs. And then the same was later described in another study. And this one was by um, Desjardins and uh, et al, uh, published in 2007, where they this study, they measured the IPP in 66 newly started PD patients, and they assessed its clinical determinants and analyzed the incidence of PD-related complications. They described a mean IPP of 13.5 for a baseline IPV of 2,000. Um, and they also actually suggested a linear increase of around 1.3 centimeter water, each 500 ml increase of the fill volume. So they suggest, this suggests uh, measuring uh, the IPP in PD patients to guide the prescription of the intraperitoneal volumes. This was one of those studies that said that, that the IPP would probably guide, uh, guide the prescription and not just the IPP. All right, so IPP itself has great variability. So a lot of um, factors can affect it. Different patients have um, variable IPPs for the same IPV. And this wide variability may be related to individual factors, such as the uh, anthropometric variables or the BMI, the BSA, um, visceral fat, muscular tone, abdominal fullness, or, you know, the, the abdominal fullness is due to the organomegaly, which we can find in PKD patients. So this is why this study is relevant, because it helps shed a light on what might affect the IPP. 
So, um, in this study, they found a significant linear relationship between the IPP and BMI, but not so much with the BSA. So, with the BSA, the P was exactly 0 0.052, which is a bit more, so making it a weaker or lesser relevant um, relation. So um, both of these studies um, that are mentioned, the first one is by the Uterello et al. And the second one is also another Italian study with a very long um, last name for the author. So both of these studies measured IPP in around, sorry, in around 50 patients um, to determine the relationship between IPP and baseline clinical characteristics such as IPV and the body surface area to evaluate the influence of IPP on PD complications. Similar to the data from the study we're discussing, um, relationship between the IPP and the BSA, the body surface area, is only weak or absent. So these findings need to be taken into account into our daily um, activity, since the IPV is often prescribed with the belief that corpulent patients, corpulent meaning they have a larger um, BMI, um, can better tolerate higher full volumes compared to slim ones. Um, how, so this is what was known. However, the findings from this study show exactly the opposite, that corpulent patients i.e. those with the larger BMI, i.e. basically our polycystic kidney disease patients um, uh, with a larger BMI have a greater IPP, while the relation with the body surface area is actually weak and less predictable. And this is of great relevance since only a few PD centers prescribe um, IPV according to the corresponding IPP measured, and most of them just use the, uh, choose the IPV according to the body surface area. So um, in adults treated with uh, continuous, the continuous ambulatory PD, the choice of the full volume is often limited to the dialysis bags, which is the standard 2 or 2.5. In the automated, um, the PD modern cyclers, the APD ones, um, those cyclers, uh, this allows adapted PD prescriptions and um, identify the IPV for the long dwell according to the body surface area. However, in adult population, the BMI seems to be stronger with strongly associated with um, IPP rather than the body surface area. So this is basically the message from this article that they're trying to tell us that we should be individualizing our full volume according to the BMI and not according to the BSA or the surface area. So abdominal fullness related to organomegaly may have an effect on the IPP, but this point has never been really investigated, um, and especially in patients with polycystic kidney disease. Data from this study suggests that patients with, higher, with bigger kidneys, uh, as assessed by a higher total kidney volume, have a, an increased IPP. However, the results also highlight a greater variability of the total kidney volume. Like I said, we had a range from uh, the range was 645 to 300 uh, uh, ml, which is a form like, which is around three to five, 15 times than the normal. Um, even, so even if the patients, even in this study, uh, the patient, the PKD patients with a higher total kidney volume belong to the highest percentile. There also was 1% with, um, uh, of the patients with, which, which is nothing because, you know, 1% of 14 patients is really um, nothing. What, we're, what they're trying to show us is the variability. So 1% with a higher total kidney volume uh, had a lower ratio and one patient with a high total kidney volume had actually a higher ratio. So all of this is variable. So this means that even if a relationship between the IPP and the high total kidney volume exists, we can't really know, or we can't really establish a cutoff value beyond which is dangerous. Um, so we can't, really, we can't really say that, oh, more than 17% is dangerous in this population. Um, since also it's very variable, the IPP and the, the ratio is very variable in this um, population of patients.
So um, limitations of this study um, and the author's routine practice. So what they do, they measure the IPP at actually the end of the PET test. And therefore some patients could have some absorbed absorbed some of the fluid affecting the volume. So the actual IPV wouldn't be very accurate. However, to account for that, they conducted the analysis also using the adjusted variable, which is the IPP over the IPV. And that's why we saw in the Pearson correlation, they used that um, to account for this, to eliminate the effect of the different drain volume. And then obviously another limitation of the study is the small population of the polycystic kidney disease patients, which was only 14. And then from this 14, um, actually four of them or three of them did not have um, um, high, the total kidney, they did not have CT scan. So we couldn't really know what the total kidney volume is. We only knew the total kidney volume of 11 out of these 14 patients. So this is how it ended. In summary, it was an eye-opening study, even though it was weak. And as you've noticed uh, um, in all of the studies that I talked about, actually all of the studies basically, like the biggest one maybe had 60 patients. So um, that was an eye-opening study on the importance of the effect of the BMI on IPP. So patients with a larger BMI have a greater IPP um, irrespective to the IPD. And polycystic kidney patients, and this is our summarizing the um, data from this study, high total kidney volume correlates with um, the ratio of the IPP over IPV. However, given the wide range of the distribution, like I said, um, increased IPP cannot be presumed because of you know, the PKD, and it needs to be uh, quantified. So personally, after um, reviewing the literature on PD and PKD patients and their similar outcomes and complication rates uh, to patients with, without PKD, I felt better about starting patients with PKD on PD. But I would just like to end this presentation. I'll just ask this following question. Um, to end this presentation, um, I would like to add a new issue um, in patients with PD, uh, with PKD that are on PD, which is nephrectomy. Um, really, how does that fit in the equation and when deciding on starting a patient with PKD um, on PD? Is that something we should be thinking about? before initiating the patient. I know Dr. Goldberg has thoughts about the whole um, issue of nephrectomies and PD. So with, with that, I would like to end the presentation. Um, it was a short presentation and I would like to open the, the floor for the discussion because I know um, that a lot of you have a lot of ideas about this. Um, I'll, I'll start as usual. Um, I have a question. Um, what was the explanation for why? Because it is counterintuitive that people with a higher BMI get pr higher pressures faster. Because one would think, unless their abdomen is full of visceral fat, which might be the explanation, um, that they have more space. So I think this was mostly uh, related to the numbers. Um, let, let's, let's go back. Um, let me show you this. Let's, I'm going to take you back the results because I'm pretty sure it was very small. Um, so they didn't provide much of this. To them, they just gave us the number and they said that, oh, this is what we... What we um, uh, really uh, noticed. They didn't really talk about it or comment on it. But that's to them. And uh, this is something new because, like you said, it's counterintuitive. And because all the data and all the studies um, really rely on the surface area and not on the BMI. So, this is to them was their new finding, but they didn't really comment a lot. And I don't honestly think they can because, you know, they only had 14 patients with PKD. And this whole population, like the whole study was like 60, or we had 77 people in this population. So I don't really think, I don't really know how much we can take from this study. It was mostly to just um, have us talk more about the PD and um, PKD patients. Yeah, I, nice job, Elsar. You know, I agree that uh, there's, you know, limited 
you, you can't say too much uh, based on the size of it, but you know, there's really was not much of a a clue that there is a problem. I've always felt like you're biased that P PKD was a problem. You know, there'd be less room. Uh, patients with uh, AD PKD, they get a, they get increased risk of hernias, ventral hernias, and I've seen that in our population, and I'm always worried about that as well. Um, so I was a little surprised, and I think it is, you know, may not be the best study, but it, but it will definitely make me think, you know, twice about, you know, not, I mean, I, I don't think I've ever not offered PD, but I've always not been real, the most optimistic about that. Um, now, as far as, you know, uh, nephrectomy, sure, you know, the problem with that, of course, is that, well, I don't want to lose any residual renal function, especially any patient on PD. I mean, the slightest bit of GFR is so much better, in my opinion, than, 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 than dialysis clearance. It's, you know, that I would never want to do that for that. Um, I know they've done it occasionally pre-transplant uh, in some patients, but that's a different issue. So I, I don't think that would be worth it. I'm just surprised that the pressures aren't even higher than they are. I mean, there isn't that much room left. Those kidneys are massive. So I think, you know, yeah, this isn't the best study, but it's, it, it kind of uh, was interesting to me because I, I would have assumed that it would have been a much more, you know, well, the pressures would be a lot higher with all that renal mass in there. I, you know, you, Roger, you answered uh, Julie's question uh, in the chat, which I really strongly agree with. And it's been my experience too. Uh, uh, tall, skinny people handle peritoneal volumes amazingly well, surprisingly well. And uh, uh, shorter, squatter, fatter people don't do it. And I think it is, uh, uh, it, they use the word corpulence, uh, but I think it is visceral fat, just like you said. And I think Julie implied the same. One thing about with regards to transplant uh, and nephrectomy, it really depends on when that nephrectomy is planned. For example, if the transplant's gonna come from a living donor, that is a year, year and a half in the future, I'll put those people on PD. And uh, uh, at the time of the nephrectomy, they'll have to come off PD for a while. But if it's, if it's a, a, a deceased donor transplant, you have no clue when it's gonna occur. There's no reason to be in a hurry to do that nephrectomy. So I think some, some of that is a, a factor simply of timing. The other thing, uh, I, I made a couple of comments in the chat. I really would love to have seen just the graph of the intraperitoneal volume versus the BMI. What they did is they did intraperitoneal volume as it affects on pressure and then compared that to BMI. And I thought they kind of cheated us out of that, uh, that relationship. The other thing I want to throw in there uh, is uh, this is uh, their references to Demelia, and Demelia does his uh, equilibration test with a four and a quarter. And this should have impressed you when you guys looked at uh, at table one. You should have been blown away by the interperitoneal volume of uh, almost twenty eight hundred. But uh, understand that that was done with a four and a quarter, and. Uh, because that's standard over there. I, it's standard in our program too. And the other thing I think it implies is that these people uh, had an awful lot of low average transporters to have that kind of ultrafiltration uh, with the two liter four and a quarter, that, that's a bundle. Uh, and that would have been interesting to see transport status relative to uh, these pressures. Uh, and then uh, the uh, other comment that I wanted to make was, uh, uh, I sent Alistair a paper. Are you going to uh, at least mention it, Alistair, or should I, uh, from the University that. of Pitt? All right. So uh, Beth Perano's program at the University of Pittsburgh did a blinded study. Uh, it was published in 99 in AJKD. And I don't know if I sent it to all the fellows or just Alistair. I can't remember. But, but uh, what they did in that study is uh, it was all in the sitting position where the nurses did uh, fill volumes of either two liters, two and a half liters or three liters behind a curtain. And then the patients were uh, allowed to ambulate for four hours and then come back and, and judge their, their symptom status. And uh, in, in fact, it was the, uh, uh, it, it turned out it was the, the large people 
who were able to discern the, the difference in the filial volume more so than the small people. Again, counterintuitive, uh, but may have had to do with the body habitus. Uh, and, and overall, they tolerated the fill volumes. And when they were blinded, uh, they weren't always, uh, uh, couldn't always tell when the difference was uh, two and a half or three liters. Uh, so the 500 milliliter increments uh, were not impressive. So, uh, uh, and, and the other thing is most of us don't do fill volumes based on, on BSA. That all comes out of the pediatric literature. I would imagine, uh, uh, see, uh, Dr. Yurabari will comment and Dr. Rodby, Dr. Lewis, Dr. Uh, El Shami. I'm pretty sure that most of us don't do fill volumes based on anything uh, related to BSA or, or weight uh, or BMI. Your comments? Folks? Uh, I don't do that. I start, depends on the situation. If the patient is coming de novo, they usually have good residual kidney function. And I start with a low volume, 2000 ml, almost everyone. And from then we build up. We don't pay attention to what is the BMI necessarily or the BSA. If the patient is coming transfer from hemodialysis, they usually don't have any more residual kidney function. And then you start to pay attention. In my experience, by the way, polycystic kidney disease don't do well on peritoneal dialysis by the time that they lose residual kidney function. They just have too many complaints of fullness. They don't feel very well. So unrelated to whatever pressure is, which we don't measure. Uh, by the way, that is an important parameter that we should be measuring. And I know that Baxter has developed a device that soon, hopefully it is approved, that will allow us a continuous measurement of intra peritoneal pressure, because that is really, really important, but we don't measure in practical terms. It is too cumbersome with the current method, I mean, to measure it directly. Uh, and uh, despite that, um, patients, we, uh, oh, a polycystic kidney disease patient, in my experience, don't do well when they require a lot of uh, volume and uh, many exchanges. I mean, uh, meaning when they lose kidney function, residual kidney function. I put a comment in the chat, I mean, which supports what you're saying. If you look at the outcome of PKD patients on hemo versus non-PKD, the PKD patients do better than the non-PKD patients on hemo. And, and then Alistair went over the PKD survival uh, on PD, and it was equal to the other people on PD, whereas it's the opposite in hemo. The PKD patients do better than the non-PKD patients on hemo. I want to actually comment on the whole uh, this. Um, so this literature, and actually it shows that at least they have non-inferior like there are other reviews. This is just one of the reviews and it just showed the similar, but another review of the data and another study published actually just showed it's at least non-inferior. And then I think also maybe an explanation to why patients on uh, HD with PKD do better is I think patients with PKD um, do better because it's just, you know, they don't have a lot of, they don't have a lot of cardiovascular complications that our normal um, patients on HD have due to secondary to, because they just have, you know, ESRD secondary to diabetes, hypertension, more cardiovascular issues. So that's also something. I'm sorry, but why would they do better because of that on hemodialysis than in PD? That will explain why polycystic kidney disease do better in hemodialysis than non-polycystic kidney disease. But why would your, what you're saying explain that PKD patients do better on hemodialysis than on PD? Not on PD. I'm saying that why, why patients with um, polycystic kidney disease on HD do better, but not comparison to uh, PD, okay. comparison to other uh, also on HD. Patients sure, everyone does better than diabetic patients, yeah. sure, for yeah. example. Yeah. And, and, and Alistair, some people think it is the endocrine function of the kidney, both in terms of vitamin D and uh, erythropoietin, because right. those, those, fact, those uh, things are maintained better in PD, PKD. Yeah. I see we, we also have, uh, sorry, um, Roger, just one second. I, I see we have uh, Jeff Pearl uh, joined in. I don't know if, Jeff, you have much experience with uh, patients on uh, with ADPKD um, who are on uh, 
peritoneal dialysis or, you know, how do you monitor them, the outcomes, any differences that you see? Um, hi, everybody. Great job. By the way, I, I uh, in this virtual world now, we can come to many more things than we could come to before. So I had a free period between patients, so I thought I'd sneak in here. Um, so I was hoping to just troll, but anyways, <laughs> um, I would say uh, I would say I would uh, echo Roger's comments that the main issue clinically we've had with patients with PKD is a higher risk of mechanical complications, hernias, um, pleuroperitoneal communications, those sorts of considerations. Um, and of course, uh, if patients have a lot of residual kidney function, then we always, in our program, start on an incremental prescription to sort of offset any concerns about mechanical complications and also, um, you know, increased intraperitoneal volume. I just, I, I, I just don't know clinically how. If I, I was thinking about what Dr. Rivari said, I don't know clinically if I had an intraperitoneal pressureometer, um, how I would use it every day in clinical practice to guide prescribing, like. What would oh, I, I would do love different? To, I would love to have it. I mean, I would I, play with it all day long. Uh, for example, <laughs> even you forget about polycystic kidney disease, the patient who ask you, doctor, can I do exercises, for example, when I have peritoneal yeah. death? I know that obviously the pressure will increase, but I will have an idea of magnitude. What happens uh -huh. with this? What happened with us? I think it will be the best toy that I can get for next Christmas, if you're thinking. Oh, of it. it's, oh. Uh, oh. It's, well, okay. <laughs> I mean, I would just have them go dry to exercise. And at that point, oh. I mean, what's their intraperitoneal pressure with now no fluid in their belly is going to be the lowest it's going to be. Of course. But you know that that's very easy to say when somebody can do when somebody has no residual kidney function is rather large again, large. BMI yeah. and needs as much of the dialysis as you can. And to go to the gym, stay dry, come back from the gym, that means about four hours or five hours without dialysis. So uh, no, I know, but it's complicated. Well, I, and, I, and with the Grex guidelines um, uh, just recently published and the benefits of exercise, I'd be, I think I'd be okay if my patient didn't do PD for three hours, but went to the gym every day. <laughs> there may be better health benefits. So... But, but so I, I, have, I have a question. Was there any? Sorry, Roger, you want to go? That's okay. So, was there any correlation between patients' symptoms? I mean, is that a poor man's IPP? Can it be used as that? Like saying, I feel too full. And I also have to say that, like, your people who need a lot of ultra filtration because they're drinking a lot are obvious. It's not just the fluid you put in, obviously, right? It's also the fluid that they yeah. alter filter. But I, was there any correlation between symptoms? They did not comment on their symptoms. Yeah, yes. and, and that's that's probably, the I think, the most important clinical correlate of increased IPV is if patients feel unwell, we should, you know, we, sh we could use it to guide how patients feel. And, you know, Tom, you mentioned that study. There wasn't a good correlation between the, the volume that was instilled and patients' perception of fullness. So to me, that leads me to believe, and I, again, this is a, a circumstantial evidence, but maybe we, there isn't as good a correlation between patient symptoms. And, you know, ask anybody who's nine months pregnant, we don't measure their IPPV, but I'll tell you, it's probably a lot higher and a lot more uncomfortable than our average PD patients. And I always try to make changes slowly and, and not make aggressive changes over time to sort of counteract how patients feel. And along and those lines, go ahead. And along those lines, you know, it's, it's, uh, you know, you had mentioned you start with two liters and I, you know, I often start with a liter and a half simply because nothing is worse than turning somebody, it's the same principle, obviously, nothing's worse than starting off bad and having a bad start and then getting turned off with it. You know, Tom would talk about incremental dialysis, I don't know, Tom, 10, 15 years ago. Um, and, uh, and, you know, I kind of didn't quite see how that would work, but it works totally with PD. Yeah. It's, it's, it's a lot tougher yeah. than chemo, but it's a, you yeah. know, there's no rush. They have a lot of residual function and I do that, you know, um, I was a, kind of assumed you guys measured pressure. I'm, I'm glad you don't, not simply because I don't feel like I'm, you know, not doing something I should be doing. Um, yeah. And I think it kind of, you just can't, it's like pain. You can't tell how, you know, pain is subjective and you just can't tell how people are going to tolerate uh, pain or discomfort. So you just kind of, you know, I start them slow and work them up and keep my fingers crossed. You know, the only other yeah. thing I'd mention about about uh, PKD, uh, you know, I've lost a couple to hernias and, and it's a big deal because it, 
you know, they need mesh and then the, and then the doctors, you know, the surgeons don't want to start PD for a long time after the mesh. And um, then they go on hemo and they may not want to come back. But the other big problem is diverticulitis. And, I, you know, because PKD yeah. has a much higher instance. And I've lost several patients to recurrent gram-negative infections yeah. from that. As long as we're on the topic of, you know, failure failure in a, in, in a, based on a disease, that, that always yeah. worries me. But again, not a re. I, it's not a reason, you know, it's not a reason I wouldn't put anybody on PD. The, yeah. You know, the, the, it's a unique population. And when you start comparing survival, you know, and these things are net, people are never are randomly put on PD or hemo. And I don't think they'll ever randomly be put on hemo and PD. And, you know, one thing about PKD is the family supports are so strong with these patients that um, transplant is a wonderful option unless they're, unless their relatives have used up all their uh, that, that, you know, they're, they're donors already that, you know, I don't have that many patients because, you know, they're, they're identified early and you can get them, uh, with a little work, you can get them transplanted and avoid dialysis altogether. So that's all I have to say. I, I have two, uh, two questions. Uh, Dr. Uh, Rabari, for the, um, the IPP measuring device that Baxter is developing, I, I, I know that you had mentioned it to me briefly before, but this is during their treatment, right? Yeah. Like real-time measuring, would that be something that they would add to the share source platform? I, I imagine so. I cannot give you those details because it's yeah. private. Yeah. 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 It doesn't belong to me. Yeah. The, the but, one thing I would say, the one thing I would say, and we're missing, I don't know if there's any pediatric uh, PD practitioners here, but I wonder clinically if IPP has a bigger role to play in pediatric PD prescription, where we sort of have um, kids that are changing in body size and habitus over time. And we, you know, where the, our pediatric colleagues really do spend a lot of time trying to optimize the right dwell volume, keeping patients comfortable. And so I don't have that expertise, but I was just wondering if anybody does have that expertise with the role of IPP in um, pediatric PD. No, no, I don't. I don't have it, but I was going to make the comments in terms of what you were mentioning before: symptoms and the relation to IPP. Is that most of the patients again have diabetes and they tend to have their own epigastric issues with emptying, fullness, and a lot of complaints that unfortunately complicate so much. Is it this inter? I mean, intraperitoneal pressure increase, or yeah. is it intrinsic problem in the stomach? Yeah. So that introduces so much confounded in terms of a clinical interpretation of fullness. Yeah. The, the other thing that Tom no, think, got me thinking about, oh, sorry, go ahead. No, I was just gonna say, I, I think the really troublesome population is our urgent start PDs who often are literally oliguric like or anuric, um, either AKIs that don't recover or AKI superimposed on CKD. And in them, you have less of a luxury to kind of gradually increase those volumes. Um, so I think those people are much more challenging um, to start a prescription on. And I was gonna say to Tom's comment about, you know, I'll put it in Tom's words, the shorter, more obese, fatter patients. Um, not my words, <laughs> Tom, you can say that. Um, I was just gonna say BMI is an imperfect measure. Uh, right? So there's different shaped people. So it'd be interesting to look at, you know, once Jamie, Jamie's toy comes to market, Jamie, we're, you can do the study where you look at, you know, centripetal obesity and, and visceral fat mass how it relates to IPP and maybe a more, a more, per, a more, um, more, a better marker of, of that centripetal obesity than just BMI, which is, you know, fat muscle in all sorts of locations and places without any discrimination of that. Sure. There is a, a, one of the frustrating things for uh, us has been there's about a 15% discordance between ultrafiltration volume and transport status. And it makes you wonder uh, whether this IPP is related to that discordance. I don't know if it's been studied in that context. Is anybody? You mean the, the smush concept that you like smushed pressure the other way? Yeah, well, that, that's one of the theories that Ronco's team here just proposed, but, but there's always been this discordance about 15% of the time. Has anyone on the...
I lost you, Osama. I think Osama's internet connection is issues to uh, fill volumes or symptoms that patients are having. Can you repeat it? You your internet cut oh. out when you're asking. Oh, sorry. Um, uh, I said, has has anyone here recommended nephrectomies for a for their ADPKD patients as they started losing residual kidney uh, function and needed to go up on the fill volumes for their patients? Uh, and how have they fared? Um, the only nephrectomies I've ever done have been in preparation for transplant and not related yeah. to IP fill volume. They will yeah. lose the residual kidney function and I'm not sure whether the balance yeah. good versus evil <laughs> will be. And, 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 and we're not talking about it, but a big population that we're actually not talking about are our female patients with PKD and polycystic liver and the impact of an expanding liver. To be honest, that's actually been more clinically an issue for me than the kidney size in, in some of our female patients on PD and um, what to do with an expanding liver. And we have sent our patients for cyst sclerotherapy of the very large cyst to debulk it. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. I personally have to go. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Yu. And I don't know if uh, Dr. Golper, any, any final remarks? No, thank you. It's good to see uh, this uh, international uh, presence. Absolutely. Thank you, everyone, for joining. And, uh, you know, I hope you leave today's discussion having uh, learned more than, you know, when you first tuned in. I know I did for sure. And I'll see you all next month. All right. Thank you, Alasar. Great work.